Welcome to the topic where we look at the history in more detail. When taking a history from a patient presenting in pain, you need to consider seven broad uh, headings. One is the reason for the referral. Is this patient coming to you because the GP or primary care physician is just unable to manage this patient anymore and he or she needs support and help? Is this because you have being referred a patient for a specific and targeted intervention, say? The second heading we look at is uh, the history of the pain, which I'll elaborate on in a little while. Number three are the medications and therapies that the patient is taking and has taken. And I've said therapies because it's not just medication and drugs that, it, that the patient's taking, but what other things has the patient uh, trialed. Four and five, as all good doctors would, we need to take a, a medical history, surgical history, consider allergies, as well as taking a systemic history. And then, of course, six and seven, consider the psychological aspects of this patient as well as the social aspects. And, we, and again, as I've mentioned, we always forget about the psychology and the social aspects. So, history of pain. There are three things that you need to get from when, when taking a history about the pain. You need to understand the characteristics of the pain, and this is the stuff we all learn as medical students. The quality, radiation, um, where it is, what it feels like, um, and what are the temporal features of this pain. And of course the associated features as well. So the characteristics of the pain. You need to consider the severity and intensity of pain. If a pain has got a, a, a pain rating score of 1 out of 10, uh, it may or may not be of relevance. Whereas if a pain continuously scores ratings of 9 and, 9 and 10 out of 10, this is significant. So characteristics and severity. And then again, importantly, what most of us forget is what is the impact that the pain has on the quality of life and level of function. So is the patient able to go about looking after themselves? Uh, is the patient able to do the cooking and cleaning and domestic chores? How does this affect the patient's ability to socialize and work? So history of the pain, you're looking at the characteristics of the pain, the intensity and severity of the pain, and the impact that the pain has on the patient. Now let's look at medications and therapies. Um, these are the things that you need to consider. Now I'm not saying you need to ask specifically about all of these things, but again, some patients will have had many medications that they'll have tried. Some patients will have had a whole host of injections and interventions that they've tried, and if they have, then this is the area that you need to focus on. So looking at um, medication, not only what the patient's taking, not only what the patient's had, but what these effects, uh, what the medication has done to the pain. Has it done anything to the pain? Has it given the patient side effects? It's important for you to decide if the patient's had an appropriate trial of medication. I see it all the time where a patient comes to me and says, well, I've tried amitriptyline, I've tried gabapentin, and it didn't work. And then you go ahead and ask them a bit more about it. Well, how many days did you have it for? two days. What happened? Oh, I got dizzy, so I stopped it. And this is not an appropriate trial of medications, and perhaps it's been because the patient wasn't uh, educated on the medication and what to expect when taking these medications. So that's very important when you're, when you're finding out about medication that the patient takes. And of course, what this medication did to the level of function, uh, patient's ability to socialize and work. If you're taking high doses of these medications and the patient's not thinking clearly, well then this is, this is significant and this needs to be considered. Uh, injections. You're going to need to inquire about injection therapy that the patient's had. I had a patient recently who uh, was referred for an epidural steroid injection. She had uh, generalized lower back pain, um, multi-level disc degeneration. On examination and history, this was a key reason for her coming to see me. Um, she had no red flags, there was nothing else of note, and she'd previously had an epidural steroid injection and had re response to it that lasted her a year. So it was pretty simple and it's quite nice to have a simple case like that. That's what she came for, we excluded anything major, particularly the red flags, and booked her in for a steroid injection. Stimulation therapy is important, has the patient had acupuncture or TENS? And of course spinal cord stimulation may be of relevance. 
You can also inquire about other therapies such as physiotherapy. Some patients come to you and say, I had hydrotherapy, doc, it was fantastic, I, I need you to prescribe it for me. Um, so these are things for you to consider. Some patients may have had cognitive therapy and been through pain management programs and they need a boost or a top-up of pain management. Now when considering medications and therapies, I've put at the bottom substance abuse screen and this is important. It's quite a, it's quite a tricky topic to, um, to uh, start off with your patients and that's why I generally do a down list. So once you're developing that rapport with a patient, you might say to them, I need to inquire about something else and something more specific and it's just because it will allow me to manage your pain a bit better. So in a non-confrontational way, you may need to ask about drugs that the patient's taken, whether they be prescribed or recreational. Uh, I've seen a lot of patients that share opioids amongst themselves in the family. One's got a chronic illness and uh, gives medication to the other. I mean, these are things you're trying to understand and find about, uh, trying to understand. Don't forget about smoking and caffeine. Um, you may have a patient that's taking lots and lots of coffee and comes to you uh, fairly anxious, and this might be something that can simply be uh, managed by reducing that. You can see the lovely tablets we've got there, those uh, OxyContin 20 milligram tablets uh, that, that uh, are the bane of our lives. Um, and that's to remind us to consider opioid risk stratification. Whether the patient's on opioids or not, if you're considering prescribing opioids, uh, you need to stratify these patients. And there's, there'll be another topic and discussion on opioid risk stratification, but this is particularly important nowadays. And everyone's talking about it, and we all need to consider uh, this before we prescribe. Last but not least is complementary and alternative medication. Quite a good exam topic as well. If you ask for it, you'll be amazed at how many patients are taking other medications or other complementary therapies. And it's important because it might mean that they, um, uh, they are unable to relate to their doctors, unable to trust their doctors, and this might be something that you need to work with in your patients. So systematic history, important. For example, if you've got somebody taking high doses of opioids or benzodiazepines, this will have an effect on cognitive function, may have an effect on mood, may have an effect on libido. And of course, opioids and renal dysfunction, this is something you may need to consider. So take a considerate, um, or so take a considered history. On this, when taking a, um, a systemic history, I consider my biological and neurovegetative features of depression. So this is where I consider um, asking myself if this patient is depressed and go about making a diagnosis. So consider the biological symptoms and consider the neurovegetative symptoms. They're there for you to read and we all pretty much know them. At this point, and hopefully you will have got an idea about whether you need to do a suicide screen for your patients. The aim really is to find out about whether these patients are talking to you or thinking about death um, as a mere means of communicating their angst and pain or if this is something that is real. And this is quite difficult to do uh, uh, in real life, um, but it's something that you have to consider. It's easy for me because in the pain clinic that I work, we have um, a suicide screening uh, couple of questions that we need to ask our patients. And we, and we do this for every new patient. And we have um, an algorithm for management. So if, if they're of low risk, we'll just merely monitor them. But if they have a high risk, we can uh, refer them straight on to the psychiatrist in the clinic. You may, need to, you may consider asking your patients a series of questions, starting off with the less uh, in, uh, intrusive questions. So, do you have thoughts of death or killing yourself? Um, tell me a bit about those thoughts. Do you know where you would do it? Do you know how you would do it? And we're getting a bit more detailed now. Um, do you have the equipment to do it? Have you finalized your affairs and sorted out things? Um, have you written a good bio letter? And as you progress down this list of questions, you need to ask yourself if this is something that is real and something that you need to deal with. Just recently, I had a patient that came to me and we started asking, I started asking her these questions and um, it was clear she would, um, she was very grateful for me to ask her these questions because it allowed her to express herself and it allowed me to refer on to the psychiatrist almost immediately. 
Now, the psychological history is important, and as doctors with our acute medical um, uh, hospital hats on, we forget about the psychology of patients. In the chronic pain setting, this is vital. There are a number of uh, psychological aspects or psychological things that you need to consider, and I'll try to make it as simple as possible for you to give you some information and allow you to consider this for your patients. If patients have a couple of these things, the so-called yellow flags, you would consider sending them on to your allied health colleagues or possibly enrolling them in a pain management program so you can change a bit of their psychology. So you need to consider your coping strategies, your um, pain behaviours, so there's behaviours and cognitions that may be abnormal or maladaptive. And then three big things you need to consider is pain catastrophic thinking, the locus of, um, locus of control, and the patient's self-efficacy, which I'll elaborate on in a second. So coping strategies. The definition is a cognitive and behavioral efforts undertaken by one to manage internal or external demands that are taxing. So that's the psychological definition, but it's how patients go about um, dealing with stresses. And they, they go about it in two ways, really, by cognitively um, um, approaching these stresses and, of course, in their behaviours. So it's cognition and behaviours. Now, the coping um, strategies questionnaire, which I think was, um, I can't remember who it is, but it is referenced, um, so you will have the reference, was developed a number of years ago, and there was a short couple of questions that looked at seven coping strategies. And these were positive coping strategies as well as negative coping strategies. So the positive coping strategies that the patients have are they divert themselves or they divert their um, thoughts away from the pain, they reinterpret the pain. They uh, talk to themselves and reassure themselves about what's going on. They also can deny and ignore the pain. And another coping strategy is to increase their levels of activity, with all, which all too often our patients don't do. Negative coping strategies are the, are the pain catastrophizers and those that pray and hope to get better. So what I've done in this slide is given you all but the behavioral cognitions and strategies that I could find, as well as the um, cognitions that they use to cope that I can find and put them into negative behaviors, positive behaviors, negative cognitions and positive cognitions. So you can consider these things when you see a patient and try to decide for yourself whether they have the abilities to cope or whether they need to be given the abilities to cope. So the negative behaviors, and this is common in most pain patients, uh, they would rest themselves. They develop a fear-avoiding kind of approach to pain. So they are fearful of doing particular movements. They avoid doing particular movements, and they get into that downward spiral of chronic pain. They have poor lifestyles, and we now consider to live in pain as to live with a chronic disease such as diabetes or ischemic heart disease. So they need to change their lifestyles, perhaps. Um, eat too much, do too little activity. These patients are unmotivated, and this is a negative behavior. A lot of my patients, a lot of our patients, will pop a pill when they feel pain, and that's not a good way of looking at pain, and that's not a good way of uh, behaving towards their chronic pain. So the so-called chemical copers, they also drink a lot, smoke a lot. Um, looking at self-efficacy, which I'll uh, give you a definition for in a few minutes, um, those with a low self-efficacy essentially had negative behaviors. A cry for help, I'm going to kill myself, I, I can't do this anymore, is a negative behavior. This is something to work on. Uh, patients that display pain, um, some, some patients that I've seen have been proud of their pain, and this is part of their lives. I remember seeing now quite a few patients that have been proud to display their um, fentanyl patches on their chests and upper part of their body for all to see, particularly those with high doses of fentanyl. So those are abnormal um, and negative behaviors around their pain. Those that use AIDS, uh, walking sticks, um, these are possibly negative, negative approaches to pain. And of course, those that keep on seeing you, keep on phoning, keep on presenting to the ED department in pain, these are negative behaviors. So we aim to move patients from negative behaviors to positive behaviors 
Uh, and examples of positive or good behaviors in coping with pain would be increasing the levels of activity. My pain is not going to be bad for me. I need to keep moving. Um, to pace themselves and do things in small aliquots. Improve their lifestyle, pretty obvious. We need to try and motivate these patients. We need to get them to use less medication, and this is a key factor of pain management. Get them um, to, to wind back down on the opioids that they're generally taking. We need to improve their self-efficacy, which is improve their confidence in doing things around pain. We need to stop them crying out for help. We need to show them that they shouldn't be displaying pain. We need to get rid of their walking sticks and um, other things that they use to, to cope with pain. And ultimately, we need them to self-manage them. Uh, we need them to move into an, uh, a degree of self-management. So the negative cognitions that they have is they catastrophize, they pray, they, they, they blame somebody else for their pain. And they also think that the pain is bad and damaging themselves, which it may not be, it generally isn't. Um, we need to move their locus of control, and I'll talk to you about that in a, in a couple of minutes, but those with a high external locus of control generally has a negative cognition. So I think that the things happen to me because it's just fate and bad luck, and there's nothing I can do about the situation that I'm in. So that's an external locus of control. Positive cognitions are those that can reinterpret the pain. They talk to themselves. They relax themselves. They can sometimes ignore the pain or express pain, and, and women are generally better at expressing their pain. We need, to let, we need to educate these people so that they understand their pain, and that's a key feature of pain management. And as I've mentioned, we need to get them from a high external locus of control into a more higher internal locus of control. In other words, they feel like they're responsible for things. So pain catastrophizing, very topical, a uh, lot of articles out there. We're all talking about it at the moment, and it's a perfect exam question. The definition it is it's a set of exaggerated negative cognitions or emotions brought to bear during an actual anticipated painful situation. So what that means really is they, they, they have histrionic-type thinking around their pain. Catastrophizing has been repeatedly and consistently linked with the following, that severity of pain. Disability, remember we've discussed pain as causing suffering and disability. Catastrophizing is related to excess opioid use. It's related to pain behaviors, particularly those fear and avoidance type behaviors of, of certain movements and doing things. And pain catastrophizing goes hand in hand with depression and anxiety. And the three aspects of, of catastrophizing that Sullivan um, uh, talked about in his paper, which is referenced, is the rumination of things. So they think about things over and over. They magnify their thoughts, and they feel hopeless about their, uh, about their situation. Now, self-efficacy is the confidence that patients have in performing activities while they're in pain. So you might want to get an idea about your patients and how confident are you to go about doing the shopping, visiting your friends, doing uh, 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 socializing, driving, driving far distances if you're in pain. And those that have a high self-efficacy are, are able to do things despite the pain and that's important and that's what we want from our patients. The locus of control the definition really is the extent to which individuals believe that they can control the events that affect them. So if you're motivated, proactive, face things head on, you've got an internal locus of control. Um, you believe that the things that you do have direct implications on where you are in this world. This is quite a psychological kind of uh, topic, but nevertheless it is important for some of our patients. Those that feel they've got nothing um, that they can do uh, are generally the pessimists, and a lot of our patients are pessimists or have pessimistic thinking. This is something we can educate and hopefully change them. So moving on to the social history, this is something we all forget about. It's always something we think about last, but nevertheless, I want you to consider it. And here's a couple of little things that you should consider for all your patients. Is there somebody living with a chronic disease in the family? I had somebody recently there where I think she was she had fibromyalgia and was surrounded by two or three people with fibromyalgia. And it, it's going to be difficult, no matter how you look at it. 
So you need to find out about this because if you can control one aspect and you've forgotten to control the other aspect, management is going to be difficult. So who else in the family is living with pain? Who else has a chronic disease and is in that chronic disease paradigm? Is there abuse and neglect? And this is topical as well. Um, if you ask for it, you will find it, and you'll be amazed at how many people have actually come through that kind of social background. Drug abuse, alcohol, this generally we can get a sense for, but it might be something you need to ask about directly. An over-solicitous family member is somebody that might potentiate the situation. I see a lot of patients where they say to me, well, my husband, my wife, my father, my mother has told me to go on the disability pension and when they're in that situation it's quite hard to get them back at work and get them off the, the, the disability grants. Those with chaotic lifestyles are those that generally have or been around people with personality disorders and that uh, will be the topic of another discussion. Now the last thing I want to mention is if everything becomes completely uh, complicated and you forget about these seven things in taking your patient's history I've given you something for you to revert back to just in case and uh, this is with thanks from Professor John Thompson from Newcastle. Uh, he's allowed me to use his so-called pain frame framework uh, within which a patient's pain operates and it's a, it's a crib really. Um, the pain frame, the letters stand for a number of things that I've already discussed so P is the place of the pain, where it is in the body. A is the area of pain and you might ask the patients to draw uh, the area of pain and generally patients have done this on a brief pain inventory before they've gotten to you. The intensity of pain, move on to the nature of pain, so is it a neuropathic pain, is it a nociceptive pain? Have a look at the frequency of pain or the, the, the temporal features of pain. Uh, R stands for reducing factors, so what make them better? Augmenting factors is the A. And then the M and the E in frame are the mental and, and environmental aspects, so the psychological aspects and the environmental aspects or social aspects. So this is another way that you might choose to approach your patients in pain, taking a history using the pain frame. That concludes this topic.